This episode of the Virginia History Podcast is brought to you in part by Jolie Brown, our newest Patreon subscriber. Stay tuned to the end of the episode or visit the show notes page to find out about how you too can support the podcast on Patreon. Carry me back to The night was stormy. Waves tossed the little ship called the Charity and all of her passengers violently through the Atlantic. The passengers and crew were just two weeks from reaching Virginia when the storm struck. Characteristically for the age, the crew believed that God was judging them for carrying a witch. John Bosworth, the charity's captain, heard the rumors spreading among his crew, which importuned him to confront the elderly woman in question, one Mary Lee. Bosworth refused for some time, but the crew's continued pleas mixed with the unabated storm wore the captain down. After hearing the counsel of two passengers, a merchant named Robert Chipson, and 25-year-old Henry Corbin, Bosworth relented. Two of the crew were ordered to inspect Lee's body for witch marks, something akin to marks resembling a snake bite, because, as it was believed in the 17th century, the devil, or one of his demons, would visit a potential victim and enter her body through interaction with a serpent. It was determined that Lee did have these telltale marks, so in the midst of the storm, she was taken to the top deck and bound to the ship's capstan, where she rode the tempest out all night. When morning broke, young Corbin was commanded to inspect Lee's marks. They had apparently shrunk into her body during the night. But no matter, Lee, frightened, confessed to Henry that she was indeed a witch. Against Bosworth's commands, the crew then unbound Lee and hanged her. Once she was pronounced dead, Lee's lifeless body was then thrown overboard into her cold, Atlantic grave. Thus, it was against this terrifying backdrop that one of Virginia's first family's patriarchs journeyed to the New World. I've been walking around this town The storms that plagued the Charity's transatlantic trek blew the ship off course, forcing it to land in Maryland instead of Virginia. So Henry Corbin didn't come to Virginia first, as we have record of his Maryland arrival in 1654. It is this same documentation from which we know Corbin's age, as well as elderly Mary Lee's execution for witchcraft. So the little that we do know about Henry pre-1654 is that he was born in 1629 based upon his declaration that he was 25 in June 1654. Further records seem to indicate that Henry came from an old English family, which extends as far back as the 1100s, when a Robert Corbin appears in English records dating to Henry II's reign. The Corbin name expanded over the next two centuries as documentation reveals increased land holdings coming into the family estate centered in Warwickshire, England. Genealogical work done by C.L. Kingsford and the Earl of Beauchamp, used to compile a chronological list in the Virginia Magazine of History and Biography, shows the Corbin progression leading to the families obtaining Hall End and lands associated with it in Polesworth, 
The list continues by illustrating that the Corbin lands generated a tidy 109 pounds annual sum by the mid-1400s, making the Corbins a moderately wealthy gentry name. Such a claim to status was certainly solidified by a 1574 deed which displayed the Corbin three ravened shield affixed to the document, something only landowners could do. The man using the Corbin shield happened to be Henry Corbin's grandfather, George. I say all of this to illustrate that Henry Corbin came from a somewhat wealthy, established line as can be proved by the genealogical records that we have. Henry, however, suffered from the same situation as many of his other first family members. He wasn't firstborn. So he had to use the connections of wealth that he had to create a new life. And using those connections, he chose to go overseas. But it seems that Henry wasn't the first in his family to set sail for lands unknown. His oldest sibling, Thomas, also embarked on overseas missions to increase wealth through trade. Younger brother, Gavin, also embarked on his own merchanting career that involved at least Middlesex, Virginia. Thus, the early 17th century Corbins sought to build upon their land wealth by joining the world's expanding trade network. Thomas and Gavin's work prompted Henry to find his place in the new family business. He did that first by moving to London, where he learned a great deal as well as firmed up connections before choosing to become the permanent overseas Corbin representative. Though Gavin and Thomas didn't set foot in the New World, they certainly did have a strong interest in what took place across the Atlantic after Henry ventured to the colonies. According to extant letters Gavin and Thomas sent to one another, Gavin wanted to secure a Virginia-built ship, the Virginia Barclay, to sail to England for fine-tuning. Once fine-tuned, the ship was to be laden with materials to build and furnish the church at which their brother Henry was a vestryman. This church happens to be Christ Church, Saluda, Middlesex County. Thomas and Gavin's correspondence shed some light on contemporaneous events, such as Bacon's Rebellion, which was going on at the same time as the letters were written. Though both Corbins had interest in Virginia, especially given that Gavin was the colony's financial agent in London, and even served as deputy treasurer in 1678, neither brother was as involved as Henry. We can't know with certainty the exact date of Henry's move from Maryland into Virginia, but we do know that he was in the colony by 1657 because of a bond he signed on January 3rd of that year. He had secured land south of the Rappahannock River before marrying the widow Alice Eltonhead, whose first husband, Richard Eltonhead, was a messenger hired by Lord Baltimore and sent to Maryland, where he was killed during the battle on the Severn River in 1655. The Eltonheads were highly influential Maryland settlers during the era, which served Henry well in both colonies. Henry and his new wife moved southward to settle their new lands soon after marrying and Henry rapidly established himself in the newly forming power structure that expanded away from Jamestown. In addition to the prosperous trade activity being undertaken by Henry and other emigrating colonials, Henry leveraged his familial connections as well. His wife Alice was related by marriage of her sisters to many of Virginia's leading power brokers, such as John Carter, William Brokus, Ralph Wormley, and Sir Henry Chichely. Using his newly created wealth and political connections, Henry quickly positioned himself among his peers by first being named Justice of the Quorum in Lancaster County. This meant that no court business could be conducted without his being present. In fact, some court proceedings even took place in his own home given that Lancaster County was newly created and had yet to erect official governmental buildings. Corbin also served as a vestryman for Christ Church Parish, the same parish that brothers Thomas and Gavin referenced in their letters. Additionally, Henry's landowning position and court offices authorized him to handle Indian issues along the frontier. Examples of his performing this role can be seen in that Henry had to settle land disputes between settlers, and sometimes between settlers and Indians. Further, Henry was called upon to protect Indian Ned, a local Indian being attacked by members of his own tribe. Henry had to resolve tensions and protect Ned from further harm, a task that seems to have been accomplished well. Henry even had to protect local tribes from encroaching colonists that violated previously signed treaties that protected native property ownership. For his work, Lancaster County elected Corbin to represent them in the 1659 General Assembly. His work at that assembly earned Corbin the quick call-up to the Governor's Council in 1663, where he remained until his 1676 death. Thus, within six years, Henry established himself as a major force in Virginia.
During that 13-year period, Corbin served the colony in various roles, such as his being sent to Maryland to negotiate an economic agreement in which Maryland was to reduce her tobacco output. Such a reduction was to lower supply and therefore raise prices. Using his strong Maryland connections, Henry did secure the agreement, but it was never enacted due to complications surrounding the Navigation Acts and other fallout stemming from Governor Berkeley's concurrent England visit. After these negotiations, Corbin remained in high office as a close advisor to Berkeley and assisted the governor in fighting the Dutch during the 1660s, as well as putting down an indentured servant revolt known as the Birkenhead Conspiracy, which plagued York and Gloucester counties. Henry also appears to have been around for the beginning of Bacon's Rebellion and may have been killed by raiding Indians on January 8, 1676, or so the Corbin family tradition states. Before his death, Henry amassed incredible land holdings, mostly between the York and Rappahannock rivers, amounting to around 18,250 acres. Among those holdings were Corbin Hall, Machetic, Peckatone, and Buckingham plantations. He made his home at Buckingham in Middlesex, but he is known to have often visited the surrounding landscape, such as when he famously entered the banqueting hall agreement between Richard Lee, Thomas Gerard, Isaac Allerton, and himself. The agreement was that the four powerful landowners would meet annually beginning in 1670 at the banqueting hall built on Corbin's Peccatone near Jackson's Creek in Westmoreland County. The banqueting hall agreement also illustrates how well-liked Henry was. From the accounts we still have, his industry as well as his congeniality together aided Henry's political and financial rise. Certainly, we have an incomplete record from the period, but much of what we do know paints Corbin as a peaceful man who appears to have gotten along well with both native and colonists alike. Such was Corbin's position before his 1676 death that he personified Virginia prominence and wealth, which was illustrated by the statement, as rich as Corbin, that many Virginians used when declaring someone to be wealthy. Henry wrote his will a year before his somewhat mysterious death. He was wealthy, even for that time, which allowed him to set a solid foundation for future Corbin generations. Among the provisions listed in his will, given to his wife Alice, were silver plate, jewels, household goods, half of the year 1675's crops on all of his plantations, tobacco excluded, and the choice of any plantation upon which she chose to live. The will further goes on to state that Henry's oldest daughter, Letitia, also known as Lettuce, was to be given 500 pounds as well as 2,000 acres of land in her name, which also allowed her to transfer that land to her progeny. The only catch here was that she couldn't receive any of these bequests until she married or the day of her 21st birthday, whichever came first. Until that time, Lettuce was to receive 20 pounds a year. But she didn't have to wait, however as she married Richard Lee II in 1674, the year before Henry codified his last will. The land she received lay in Stafford County, in an area that is today known as Lee's Sylvania, and it made both she and her new husband even wealthier than they already were. It should be reminded that Lettuce and Richard were a vital part in founding the Stratford Hall line of the Lee family, since it was their son Thomas who established the plantation from which so many great Lee figures sprang such as Richard Henry, Francis Lightfoot, Philip Ludwell, Lighthorse Harry, and Robert Edward, to name just a few. So, Lettuce was taken care of, but Henry didn't forget his remaining four daughters either. He bequeathed at least 450 pounds to each of them, with a further 50 pounds contingent upon how well his son's work fared in England. In addition, each of those girls was to receive a thousand acres of land that bordered Letitia's grant. The same stipulations applied in that the land was bestowed upon their 21st birthday, or marriage, whichever came first. After Lettuce, Alice was the next oldest daughter, and she married Philip Lightfoot of Teddington Plantation, which is today's Sandy Point in Charles City on the Chickahominy River's north side, where it meets the James River. It wasn't as powerful a match as Letitia's, but nothing to write off either. Philip Lightfoot came from a quite prominent family in his own right, holding high offices in Virginia, and had merchanting, legal, and religious connections reaching far back into England. Next in line came Winifred Corbin, who married Rappahannock County's Colonel Leroy Griffin. A notable descendant coming from their line would be their grandson Cyrus Griffin, 
who held various posts throughout the colony before serving Virginia after the War for Independence ended. He also holds the distinction of having been the last President of the United States under the Articles of Confederation before he was finally appointed Judge of the United States District Court for the Court of Virginia by new President, his successor, George Washington. Ann Corbin was third oldest, and she married very well in wedding Richmond County's Colonel William Taylor of Mount Airy. Together, Ann and William bore three children, Elizabeth, John I, and William, before Ann died in 1694, sadly at the age of 30. The last of Henry and Alice's daughters was Frances, who married the highly influential Edmund Jennings. Jennings was on the Virginia Council and held many high offices such as Attorney General, Governor, and twice being Secretary of State. Francis and Edmund would have at least four children together, Margaret, Francis, Priscilla, and Edmund II, who all married into Virginia's highest ranks. Margaret and Priscilla wed into the Hill family, while Francis married into the Grimes, and Edmund II married Ariana Vanderhaden. Edmund and Ariana's daughter then married into the Randolph line when she wed John Randolph II, which by that time in the 18th century, it seems that all of the first families of Virginia were related in one way or another. I've been thinking of things I don't know And I'm not about to settle with the present if my heart wants to go Henry and Alice also had three sons, two of whom survived into adulthood, Thomas and Gavin. Thomas became a prominent merchant, owned land in Virginia, but moved back to England, where he conveyed interest of his lands to Edmund and William Jennings, just before Thomas died unmarried in 1732. Gavin, on the other hand, survived infancy, remained in Virginia, and though he didn't obtain a seat on the governor's council, he did hold many local positions of distinction such as Justice of the Peace for Middlesex, Rappahannock Naval Officer, Collector for the Rappahannock District, and served in the House of Burgesses for both Middlesex and King and Queen Counties on numerous occasions. He often clashed with Governor Alexander Spotswood, especially after Spotswood relieved Gavin of his naval officer duties for allegedly forging documents. Gavin made sure he didn't go this fight alone, since he was part of a growing alliance which included other powerful men like William Byrd, and Philip Ludwell. On the domestic front, Gavin married three times, first to Catherine Wormley, daughter of Rose Gill's Ralph Wormley, but the pair had no children before Catherine passed sometime before 1707. During the course of this marriage, Gavin acquired 500 acres from 3,400 acres granted to Sir Thomas Lunsford and John Lomax. Both men were Catherine's uncles, thus extending the Corbin name into Caroline County, while also being tied to yet more important connections. As an aside, Catherine's uncle John was head of the somewhat important Lomax family, who also married into the Taylor line. A later 18th to 19th century relative, Judith Lomax, was the first woman in Virginia to independently publish a volume of poetry. But I digress. Gavin next married Captain John Lane's daughter, the widow of Willis Wilson, Jane. The pair had at least five children, and maybe seven, before Jane died. Many of those children occupied Virginia's highest positions. The pair's most prominent child was son Richard Corbin, who was born in 1708 and served on King and Queen County's court before moving to nearby Middlesex's court. Richard would marry John Taylor's daughter, Betty, in 1737, and bore eight children, including another Gavin Corbin, who served on the Governor's Council during the American War for Independence, and Francis Corbin, who occupied a position during the 1788 Constitutional Ratification Convention. Richard himself also occupied a position on Stratton Parish's vestry like his father had, before being added to Governor Gooch's 1747 Governor's Council recommendation list. King George II finally appointed Richard to the council in 1750, where Corbin proved to be a loyal supporter of the crown and governor, especially during the French and Indian War and thereafter. Richard would often serve as the president of the governor's council during his tenure, which illustrates his vital colonial importance. Interestingly enough, 
One might even be able to make the claim that Richard could be indirectly responsible for starting that expansive French and Indian War. It was Richard Corbin to whom a young George Washington apparently appealed for a commission against the French in 1754. Corbin's influence seemingly worked, Washington received his commission, and the rest is history that we'll discuss in more detail at a later date. As opinion turned against the crown during the 1760s and 1770s, Richard's influence ebbed, but he remained highly respected by both loyalists and patriots. King George III even elevated Richard to the lieutenant governor's office in July 1775, based upon George's belief that the embattled Lord Dunmore would leave Virginia. This appointment was the highest office held by any native-born Virginian during the colonial era. But Dunmore didn't leave and instead caused coastal Virginia, especially Norfolk, much trouble before finally being pushed out of Gwynn's Island and back to England. During that year, both belligerents chose Richard Corbin as the most trusted man to negotiate between the warring parties. Though, soon after Dunmore fled, Corbin retired to his Lanesville home, where he peacefully remained until his 1790 death. Though Richard never came out against the crown during the war, and some of his family suffered for their loyalist stance, being connected to the Corbin name was not the blight that was so often the case for many other loyalists remaining in America. Richard's daughter Elizabeth's marriage to Carter Braxton, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, proves this fact, in addition to the already mentioned Francis Corbin's serving on the Commonwealth's 1788 ratification convention. It should be noted, however, that Carter Braxton did endure some criticism for being related to the Corbin family, and Richard's sons, Thomas and Richard, both moved to England. Part of the reason that the Corbin name didn't suffer much before, during, and after the war owes to the family financial position. So many other names on the first family of Virginia lists were in serious debt by the new country's founding. Not so with the Corbins. Richard is especially known for hating debt, while also working to maintain real money's value, most admirably by successfully opposing a colonial move toward using paper money to pay down debts. The move was meant to curtail the extravagant spending being done by most of his contemporaries. But though Corbin's fight against paper money was successful, it was too late for most of his fellow Virginians. Their debts were simply too immense. Richard also earned a reputation for treating his overseers and slaves more fairly. He reasoned that treating them well and taking care of their needs served both he and his slaves best. He told his overseers that the best way to manage the slaves was by their setting an industrious example personally and not to resort to hurry and severity. To accomplish this task, overseers were to use foresight and planning ahead. In other words, it wasn't the slave's fault if work was done poorly. It was the overseer's fault. This isn't said to support slavery, but to illustrate how differently Richard approached the issues of his day. Much more can be said and will be said about Richard Corbin at a later date, so let me move on to Richard's brother John of Portobago. He was born in 1715 to Gavin and Jane, but his life was cut short unexpectedly in 1757 before a will could be produced. The lack of will allowed John's wife, Letitia Lee, daughter of Richard Lee III, to qualify as administratrix for their estate, which was valued at over 7,000 pounds with holdings at Port Tobago, Spotsylvania County, and Caroline County. Those holdings were then split between their three children, another Gavin, who I'll call Gavin IV for organization's sake, Martha, and Jane. We know very little about Jane, other than that Philip Fithian seems to have believed she was beautiful. Plump and buxom were his exact words, if not too old to marry. Martha Corbin married John Turberville, who appears to have loved his first wife so much that he willed his being buried next to Martha after he died in 1799. Perhaps that decision annoyed John's second wife, Anne, who refused a portion of her dowry bequeathed in that same will. John and Letitia's son Gavin was born at U Spring in Caroline County. Sadly, Gavin IV was quite young when his father died, and we further know very little about this Gavin Corbin. He married Elizabeth Skelton Jones in 1776, and the couple produced six known children. Other than a few land trades, that's about all we know from this Corbin line. That being the case, let's return to the original Gavin Corbin genealogy. We do know relatively more about Richard's half-brother Gavin of Pecatone. 
He was most likely born to his father Gavin and his third wife Martha Bassett of Eltham in 1725. Gavin II, as some call him to keep all of the Gavin Corbin straight, served in the House of Burgesses, representing Middlesex County on many occasions before moving to Westmoreland and taking up residence at Peckatone. Proximity to the Lee family acquainted Gavin II with Stratford Hall owner Thomas Lee's daughter, and subsequently Gavin's cousin, Hannah Ludwell Lee. The pair married and had one child, Martha, before Gavin died in 1760. Martha then went on to marry into the Turbleville family, as had her cousin, also named Martha, the daughter of John and Letitia, mentioned a short time ago. Hannah, who was allowed to keep Gavin Corbin's estate on stipulation that she never remarry, remained at Peckatone and became heavily involved in Baptist revival movements of the era. In those movements, she soon fell in love with Richard Lingen Hall, a Baptist doctor, who was even found at Gavin's deathbed. Hannah adhered to her first husband's will for two decades. She didn't officially marry Richard in the Anglican Church, but he did move into Peckatone with her by 1762. Seven years later, in 1769, Hannah's daughter Martha took over ownership of Peckatone, and in 1771, Hannah and Richard Lingen Hall moved to nearby Richmond County, where they raised two more children. Because of her position with both Lee and Corbin families, Hannah seems to have found freedom to use an aggressive voice. She ran Peckatone after Gavin's death, and ran it quite well, well enough that her prominent Lee brothers often came to her for advice. She even championed women's suffrage, an unheard of cry for the 18th century, and is known to have supported the Patriot cause against the British during the American War for Independence. Richard Corbin had three other sisters who also deserve a brief mention here. Anne, most likely born to Gavin and second wife Jane, strengthened the Allerton-Corbin bond when she wed neighboring Isaac Allerton, Willoughby Allerton's son, in the 1720s. They had four children together before Isaac died in 1739, and she remarried Christ Church Parish Reverend David Curry, who cared for Anne's children after she passed away in 1745. Another sister, Jenny, mysteriously shows up in the Bushrod family records. I say mysteriously because Jenny's name wasn't listed in her father's will, and scant evidence supports her existence. Bishop Mead mentions Jenny as having married John Bushrod of Westmoreland County, but the said John Bushrod mentioned a wife named Mildred in his 1760 will. If Jenny indeed did exist and marry John, then the Corbin name would have also spread to yet another powerful Virginia family from the time. The final sister of note was Alice, who married Culverwell Needler's son, Benjamin. Culverwell was clerk assistant to the English House of Commons before he came to Virginia in the late 1730s. His father happened to be the ejected, nonconformist clergyman, Reverend Benjamin Needler, who petitioned General Thomas Fairfax on behalf of deposed King Charles I's life. Such a connection shows just how closely tied some of Virginia's prominent families were to the English political situation and that many of them deserve the Cavalier moniker. Richard and his siblings weren't the only powerfully connected Corbins to affect Virginia. Children born to Richard and wife Betty Taylor also dot the history books. Earlier, we briefly mentioned Gavin and Francis, but there was also John Taylor, Richard Jr., Thomas, Elizabeth, Alice, and Letitia. Gavin, this one we'll call Gavin III, according to chronology, was Richard's eldest son. He was born in 1740 at Laneville, sent to Grinstead, Essex, England for schooling before he entered Christ College, Cambridge at 16 in 1756. Upon completing his studies, Gavin ventured back across the Atlantic in 1761, where he made Buckingham House in Middlesex County his home. Not too long after his return, Gavin entered the House of Burgesses for Middlesex and has the distinction of having been the last person appointed to the Royal Governor's Council in 1775. He married cousin Joanna Tucker, daughter of Norfolk's Robert Tucker, in 1762. 
The pair had six children together before Gavin died in 1779, just shy of his 40th birthday, and four years before the War for Independence officially ended. Next in Richard's lineage came John Taylor Corbin, who was born in 1746. He served in the House of Burgesses as well, and emerged as a stolid loyalist during the War for Independence. John Taylor arguably suffered the most of the Corbin family for those sentiments. He was first implicated in a letter sent to Charles Nielsen, which was read before the Virginia Convention on May 8, 1776. After the letter was read, in which John's stance was clearly stated, the convention took John into custody. The next day, John Taylor wrote a defense that stated not too long before his letter was penned, everyone in America was a loyalist. Further, he was not setting about to destroy the country, nor was he supportive of those who had those aims. Damning statements in the Patriots' eyes, to be sure. Regardless, John was released, but arrested three more times before being told to return to Caroline County and not to leave the region until the Committee of Public Safety lifted his restriction. In addition, John Taylor was ordered to pay a 10,000 pound bond to prove that he'd obey the travel ban imposed upon him. Just before John Taylor's nightmarish period began, he married Benjamin Waller's daughter, Mary, in 1772. They had six children together who, though not nearly as prominent as their parents and grandparents, continued to serve Virginia and their new country after the war ended. For instance, oldest son Richard was a member of the House of Delegates, married into the Bird Line, and raised an artillery company that served with distinction during the War of 1812 before he died in 1814. Third son, Gavin Lane Corbin, also held prominent offices such as visitor to the College of William and Mary, his alma mater, member of the House of Delegates for York County, and major in the Virginia Militia during the War of 1812. While serving in that war, Gavin Lane was severely wounded during the Battle of Hampton, where he earned high praise for his battlefield actions. Forced to retire from his military service, Gavin returned to York County, continued to serve in the General Assembly, and died aged 46 in 1821. He left behind wife Maria, daughter of Blandfield's Robert Beverly, and one-time widow of Richard Randolph from Curl's Neck, as well as four children, Richard Randolph, Lucy Beverly, another John Taylor, and Anne Bird Corbin. Richard's fourth son, Thomas of Laneville, also held the same loyalist sympathies as his father and brother John Taylor. He's mentioned by Ralph Wormley in a letter to powerful MP Charles James Fox, was living in England, where he served in the British Army and came back to Virginia in 1783. He didn't stay long, however, as he was forced to flee back to Britain soon after his arrival. Lastly to be mentioned from Richard and Betty Taylor Corbin's line are Francis, Elizabeth, and Anne. There was another daughter, Letitia, but virtually nothing is known about her other than that she was alive in 1783 and unmarried. Francis, unlike his father and brothers, didn't suffer for being a loyalist. In fact, the war took place during his education at Canterbury School and Cambridge. He joined the Inner Temple in 1777 and returned to Virginia after the war ended. Illustrating that he didn't suffer for the Corbin loyalist position, Francis occupied the House of Delegates seat for Middlesex County starting in 1784. From there, Francis quickly earned a strong reputation among his peers. He held a Federalist position in the newly forming governmental debates and can be credited with offering a resolution that called Virginia to consider ratifying the convention. Thus, just four years after his return from England, Francis was part of the Virginia Convention which ratified the U.S. Constitution. Somewhat foolishly, Francis took on Patrick Henry in those debates, who staunchly opposed the Constitution during that convention. The famous and powerful Henry made many speeches during the course of events, and had often remarked that he bowed to the majesty of the people in opposing ratification. When Corbin's time came to speak, he mocked Henry by continuously bowing to the majesty of the people. He further stated that it made little difference whether the new country was governed by a despot with a crown or a demagogue with a red cloak and a call bear wig, items worn by Henry. Henry's response to Corbin ended the argument in devastating fashion by recalling his part in the War for Independence in comparison to Francis's. That is, Henry was a plain man from Virginia 
while Francis was an aristocrat who lived in England during the war. As Henry's reply continued driving this point home, Francis, it is said, sank lower and lower into his chair. This beating aside, Francis did serve with distinction and earned the praise of such men as his friend Tench Cox and President James Madison, as well as Member of Parliament Charles Fox and Prime Minister William Pitt the Younger. Additionally, Francis married well when he wed another of Robert Beverly's daughters, Anne. They had eight children together before Francis died in 1821 at his Reed's Plantation home. Francis's sister Elizabeth is the one who married Carter Braxton, signer of the Declaration of Independence. Carter did suffer some criticism for his choice of marriage partner, but the Braxton position in Virginia was firm by this time, and the marriage persevered. Alice, Richard's last daughter, never married. But though she didn't marry, Alice's name often features as Miss Alice Corbin in her friend Thomas Jefferson's letters. The Corbins reached their zenith in the period just before the American War for Independence. A relatively short 120 years or so after Virginia Patriarch Henry Corbin arrived in the colony. During that time, they left an indelible mark upon Virginia's landscape that continued after the War for Independence ended. Even though there was a large Loyalist contingent among their ranks, the Corbins continued influencing Virginia and the United States afterward. One of their later descendants, James Park Corbin, as was the case with most mid-19th century Virginians, was touched by the Civil War in many ways. His oldest son Richard was killed in 1863 while fighting near Culpeper Courthouse. James' second-born son, Spotswood Welford, married Diana Fontaine Morey, Commodore Matthew Fontaine Morey's daughter, in 1858. Spotswood survived the war after having served in the Confederate Navy and died in 1897. But James Park Corbin's most famous Civil War connections are illustrated by his housing Stonewall Jackson at Corbin's newly built Moss Neck Plantation home during the winter 1862-1863, where Jackson's aide-de-camp records a touching story. After Jackson set up his quarters on Corbin's plantation, Stonewall became fast friends with six-year-old Janie Welford Corbin, daughter of James' oldest son, Richard. Janie and her mother, Roberta Corbin, retreated to Moss Neck while Richard was away fighting in the war. Jackson, who just one month before received news of his wife's giving birth to a daughter of his own, broke character whenever Janie came around. The six-year-old delighted the often stern general and spent hours playing with Jackson on the floor of his winter quarters. It's noted that Jackson looked forward to these playdates at the end of dreary winter days in which he tended to his army. He'd meet his young guest with presents, usually some sort of fruit that he could obtain. But one day he had nothing to offer Janie. When Janie's golden curls bobbed into Jackson's temporary home, Janie found Stonewall cutting off a golden braid affixed to one of his new uniform caps. Jackson then tied the braid to Janie's hair, much to her delight, and the famous friends played for hours together once again. In addition to Jackson's young friend, he put on a captivating Christmas banquet that 1862 winter, in which many turkeys were sent, sumptuous fixings were obtained, and oysters were fished out of the nearby Rappahannock River. It was such a spread on so great a plantation that Jackson, usually an extremely reserved and austere man, suffered affectionate criticism from his distinguished guests, Robert E. Lee and Jeb Stewart. Stewart, never a man to pass up a chance to make fun of Jackson, arrived on scene and began saying that Moss Neck's high-class interior decor fit all of Jackson's personal tastes. Stewart solemnly stated that Jackson's obvious decline in moral character would be a great disappointment to the South's pious old ladies, who believed Jackson to be a good man. Jackson blushed at this outburst and was left speechless, other than ordering that a good dinner was prepared for General Stewart. During the course of the dinner, Stewart continued poking fun at the teetotaling Jackson, who was at that time serving wine to General Lee. Lee, not to let Stewart have all the fun, joined in the merrymaking by discussing Moss Neck's lavish living quarters and how Jackson was playing soldier at the plantation. But that's not how soldiers live. To see that, Lee joked, Jackson would have to come see Lee's tent in order to find out how a soldier ought to live. The light-hearted mood at Moss Neck that winter ended with the season. 
Jackson soon moved closer to Chancellorsville in March. Just before he left the site, Jackson visited Janie, who had recently contracted scarlet fever, an almost certain death sentence for the time. Her family assured Jackson that she was recovering, but a few days after saying goodbye, Jackson received the terrible news of Janie's death. It so moved him that he wept freely at the sad news. Two months later, Old Blue Light joined his young companion after friendly fire pierced Jackson's arm, brought on infection, and Jackson died at Guinea Station. The war devastated Virginia and her leading families. The Corbins, like everyone else, didn't escape the heartbreak of losing family members such as Richard and Janie, but they continued to survive those losses. As their surviving descendants moved past the war, many of them moved out of Virginia such as Richard Randolph Corbin and his children did when they moved westward to locations including Mississippi, Texas, and New Mexico. Such moves spread the Corbin name away from their concentrated base and ensured decline shortly after the war's end. But though the fabulous wealth, power, and influence created by Corbin patriarchs may be gone, as is also the case with most of their family landmarks, the Corbin imprint upon both Virginia and American history remains. Thank you for tuning in to this edition of the Virginia History Podcast. Please help this colony to keep growing. Start by following us on your favorite podcast provider and visit the show notes page for each episode. Those can be found at vahistorypodcasts.com. Next, please consider supporting the work financially on Patreon. And perhaps you'd like some podcast merchandise, or maybe a one-time donation fits your budget best. Links for all of these possibilities can be found under the support tab on our podcast website. Other ways that also help out are liking and following us on social media. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash vahispod and follow me on Instagram at Virginia History Podcast to see some of the statewide trips that I take for future episodes. I've also uploaded podcast episodes to YouTube. They can all be accessed by finding my channel at Robert Van Ness. If you haven't already, please leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Doing so increases visibility in the Apple Podcast Network, the largest podcast outlet on the Internet. Finally, tune in again next time as we continue our walk through Virginia's history. Do 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 do